anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, what about them? I'm sorry, what, what is it that you want to research? Anti-Semitism, Islamophobia. Why, well, you can't possibly compare the two, can you? Anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. My God, woman, you have lost your mind. You dream of putting the two in the same sentence. Are you really trying to be that provocative? So these are just some of the comments that I encountered in many a closed door conversation back in 2013 um, when I embarked on this PhD journey. So the two forms of prejudice, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, have had quite an interesting and complex sort of an, an often intertwined journey over the past five or so years. Uh, a journey that I've been tracking and tracing, sometimes with, you know, uh, interest, sometimes with sheer dread, um, because it's important to me on many levels, which I'll talk about in this, um, in the course of this talk, especially seeing as it coincided quite nicely and neatly with my own PhD journey and experience. So having given you that, those snippets, I just want to say before I begin the talk that um, a, a very big thank you to everyone for coming here today um, and especially considering the weather um, and joining us as we explore this topic. I'd also really like to thank um, all the organisers at the Islam uh, UK Centre here in Cardiff, all the students and especially um, to uh, Professor Sophie um, because she, she drove me in this morning as well because <laughs> there was no hope in coming in otherwise. So with that I also think um, it's really really important as researchers not only to um, state what it is clearly that we are looking into but just as significant is highlighting what it is that we are not about to do. Because often things can get sidetracked, we can digress, and people can take sort of unintentionally and maybe sometimes take meaning from our words that wasn't really what we set out to do. So a few disclaimers before we start. I think it's important to delineate that I am not defining anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. We can leave that to the BBC. Um, but no, honestly though, there's ample amount of literature on definitions, be it academia or policy. It's just up to us as individuals, scholars or lay people um, to, to explore, to read, to open our minds. Um, that is not a dig at anyone in particular, it's just what I feel. Um, we're not here to compare or reinforce any form of a hierarchy of prejudices that pits one form of hate against another or invokes a sense that one set of sensitivities is more raw and visceral and by that more deserving than the other. If we truly are to combat hate, it should be done in unison. All forms of hate, not just religious or racial hatred, but every type, be it on the basis of sexual orientation, um, nationality, anything, absolutely anything, ageism, you, you name it. And finally, I am definitely not here to discuss the current state of post-Brexit Britain or anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, Islamophobia in the Conservatives. That's not the aim. So narrowing it down, the intent is simply this, to shine light on those most affected by anti-Semitism and Islamophobia by emphasising the need to engage with their identities, their lives, their lived experiences, by exploring their self-expressions and most importantly and significant to me, their responses to hatred. I might not be able to get through all the responses but I will, you know, share a few snippets towards the end. So essentially what I'd like to focus on today through the course of this talk is just some of my thesis approaches and findings, of which there are way too many. Um, that's the perks of being an interdisciplinary researcher, you know, and I'm sure many of you could relate to this here at the centre. 
Um, and don't worry, I shan't bog you down with reams of descriptive data or, you know, that's probably why I don't have um, a PowerPoint, as you probably noticed. I'm quite old school when it comes to this. I like to have a more interactive approach to dialogue and discussion. Um, so purposefully avoid PowerPoints, even in my lectures to students. Um, so the mainstay of my talk, and I promise I will get to it eventually, um, is really just to hone two or three areas of interest that intrigued me when I began researching the topic of racial, uh, topics rather, of racial and religious hatreds. So we'll look into conceptual framework, contextual dynamics of the cases, uh, as well as the lived experiences, much overlap, um, uh, so what's universal to the responses uh, between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, and also, crucially, what's historically con contingent. I think that's necessary to say. And finally, what use is any of this if we can't come up to solutions for challenging hatred? So how can we resolve tensions in society um, following episodes of hate by learning from one another? Um, real life solutions. Now, this part is probably more influenced not by my researcher hat or, you know, maybe my own personal sort of auto ethnographic experiences, but also um, alongside my um, research, I am, uh, I've been involved with interfaith work ever since I can remember, but specifically for the last 10 years or so since I've been at university, I've not left. Is that worrying? Is that troubling? I don't know, but it's, it's worth mentioning though. Um, so that also influences my approach to academia. So a bit about my background. I'm by no means an expert quite yet. Um, I come from a pure politics and IR background, and I think this is important to remember and to say, because I think more so than anything else that I'll say later on about how we approach things, I think realizing who we are and where we're uh, getting our footings right as researchers is, is just as important when we discuss the topics, whatever they may be. So um, during my master's, things really changed for me when I met a person who would become my supervisor and eventually also my surrogate Jewish grandfather, uh, Ned Lebeau, um, who's a professor in the War Studies Department. We were both really interested in the topic of identity. So that's kind of the, the focal point of our analysis. And misrecognition, misperception, and stereotyping. So there was an urge to make sense of the chaos around us um, and often the elephant in the room, which for many has been religious or racial tensions or hatred. To be clear, for many of us who might not be aware, there is very little room or scope in the disciplines of IR and politics for mention, let alone any deconstruction of concepts such as race and religion. They're all too readily sidelined or relegated to the realms of sociology, where I think I found my own home. Well, one of my many homes. But this bothered me. Why is it that these fields of study, why aren't they broad enough to incorporate my forms of analysis? Why is my voice left out? Um, because they're such meaningful things. You know, you can't just say this is specifically sociological research or psychological research, which many have tried to do. But there's political identity or political psychology that shape, um, so the methodologies that I use shape what we essentially um, come up with. But um, this has also led, and this is something maybe uh, for, for the researchers now who are masters and PhD students, um, it's also led to many existential crises for me personally, because I felt that I was gradually losing my footings as a researcher, right? Um, what am I? Who am I? Um, slowly, it became this niggling sort of fixation almost but the research journey enabled me to realize the, that academia needs to shed this obsession with clear cut fields, to leap out of the ivory towers and get onto the grassroots where we engage with those most affected. Hence, I was liberated from these questions. Yes, I might not get a job in mainstream academia, traditional sense. Uh, yes, I will never be a pure IR theorist. But in the words of the iconic MC and rapper Skepta, that's not me. Genuinely, that's not me. But um, 
My goal for research has been, and always will be, to bridge the gap between academia, advocacy, and what I like to, you know, the three A's, administration. So basically, ensuring that academic voices are not just heard, but also adhered to at both policy and grassroots levels, and we also learn and engage from the other. So it's this sort of golden triangle of academia, policy, grassroots. Um, so let's begin. So with regards to conceptual framework, or conceptually speaking, my approach um, to two forms of prejudice, or you know, anti-Semitism, some phobia. Later on, I'm sure I'm bound to get questions by why are you talking about prejudice? Why can't you say what they are? You know, we should be able to define them. For the sake of brevity and because of time, I'm not going to. But I think it's important to realize that we can't get bogged down. Well, what, what can happen often is when we're talking about anti-Semitism, some phobia, racism, anything, we can, as researchers, get bogged down in understanding or trying to make sense of bigotry. And in that, we often neglect important questions. So in, as a shift from prior explanations of these terms or what bigotry is, my research is quite unique in many ways, but especially in terms of the angle I chose. The focal point of my research has always been, and I say this loud and proud, agency. It is about restoring the agency of those who I am interested in studying, right? So we're not a monolith. No group is a monolith, right? There's no one voice of a community and communities are very broad. Um, so, and this is an, another, another point where the professional and the personal encounter each other and kind of um, the lines are blurred. So for me personally as well, I felt like, yes, I'm a Muslim. So many people identify as Muslim. What is Muslimness, right? And whose voices should I be listening to? How can I frame a conversation about Muslimness that is inclusive, right? So, and yes, identity informs us, right? But what about my actions, reactions, and behaviors towards both positive and negative stereotypes? Um, and can we really reduce everything down to culture? There are a multitude of factors that make me who I am, not just the internal dynamics of me as a person. Sorry, I shouldn't have said me because there's a distinction. So many of you might be familiar with George Herbert Mead's concept of the I and the me, the two parts of the self. So the I is the internal self. It's kind of the narratives that you bring. You know, it could be aspects of your identity, like your faith or your background, your gender, your orientation, etc. Now your me, the other aspect of yourself, is the socialization element, right? So your I and me are kind of being negotiated and rebalanced continuously, okay? Um, and that frames yourself. There are many different ways of looking at this, but this is just one example that really caught my eye and spoke to me. <coughs> With that in mind and this dialogical relationship between the I and the me, I thought it was worth exploring not just how socialization impacts the internal, so what society's expectations or attitudes affect the individual, but also the reaction. How do people negotiate their selfhood, basically, or negotiate the socialization and the internalization? So how does that work? And, uh, you know, in this regard, um, my work breaks away from purely sort of multiculturalist approaches, which, by the way, I think are fantastic, you know, all credit to them. I think it's, it's a, what I, I treat multiculturalism as more of a springboard for my work. So that agency is, like I said, at the center and not much of an afterthought, which can be the case sometimes. Um, so in the title, you may have noticed uh, the, the use of through the target's lens. Um, this is because, again, I explore these concepts of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia from like through the horse's mouth, really directly, first-hand uh, uh, engagement. Um, so thus it becomes imperative to really grasp what people do when they're affected by prejudices of all sorts. I wanted the raw experiences to get people to think about prejudice, about stereotypes, without actually, you know, without leading questions. Again, we could talk about research methods another time, but trying to engage with them on these topics um, through oral histories and Another aspect, which I probably won't be able to get on today, but self-esteem. Um, I looked at the, the idea of 
or the notion of collective, excuse me, self-esteem with regards to faith groups. So how people associate or, uh, you know, affiliate with um, their faith group. That's a very broad term, but um, it's not about, I, I don't want to drift into saying this is about organized religion, but it's how one identifies or approaches their faith group or their relationship with that. So looking into that, I, I spoke to people about their lived realities and also the solutions that they might have to counter Kate. So that was the conceptual sort of background. In terms of the case framing, so contextualizing the cases, you might have noticed was mentioned Weimar Germany and contemporary Britain. Now, there is this juxtaposition of a historical case and a contemporary case. Um, you know, many people would say, well, why are you comparing things that are so distinct? Why, why do you think this justifies a credible comparison? Why not? Right? As long as you can state that, for me personally, um, and also for my supervisor, who is actually a child survivor of the Holocaust, um, this was something that was very important to him. Uh, and for me, as, as a millennial, hate the term, but Muslim woman in Britain today. So looking at these two cases critically, and, and yes, realizing that they're not one and the same, but looking at them through <coughs> the, the actual reactions was really key because seeing how people in two historically, um, sort of, uh, sorry, temporally and spatially distinct settings faced with two different, um, one could say, uh, forms of prejudice or bigotry, how they react might be very similar. Whereas two people were faced with the same type of bigotry in the same spatial and temporal setting might have widely differing uh, takes or approaches to tackling that experience, right? So that's kind of what we wanted to draw out. And also, in terms of justifying it, one could see both those affected by Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, regardless of the time frame, as scapegoats. So um, Europe's scapegoats, as, as some of the readings suggest. You know, you, you, there's tons of work done on sort of media narratives that are, um, you know, hostile and demeaning or vilifying Muslims in present day Britain. Um, you can, you know, sometimes if you just remove Muslim um, and, I'm sorry, I should say that again, if you look at cuttings of newspaper cuttings as I did of Weimar era Germany, similar sort of, the Muslim bogeyman was actually, you know, it was a similar sort of, you could contrast that with a, a Jewish um, figure in German media, portrayals of it, right? Um, that's not to say that Islamophobia has suddenly become the new anti-Semitism. That's not what we're saying. And I think it's crucial to reinstate and reinforce that because anti-Semitism is still very much prevalent, right? This is not about, like I said earlier, it's not about comparing the two and saying, you know, this is, because we're not going to achieve anything, right? What is interesting f as a researcher is to, to kind of, for me anyway, the point of the comparison, but to look at how people cope with prejudice, right? Because we can see the trajectory. So my, my thesis was actually titled uh, um, Understanding Prejudice. So it was making sense of it, of the concept itself uh, through a wider lens, through looking at it through people's perspective. So I tried to typologize certain coping strategies because you know, um, often when we talk about the Muslim experience or the Jewish experience, like I said, it's the groups are mono, uh, they're treated as monoliths. And I find that really worrying and disturbing. Um, and there's so much enriching sort of evidence that we could actually be looking towards. Um, so yes, that's what I did. I developed a model of uh, coping um, with prejudice, which I won't even go into because this is where the psychology comes in. And like I said, I'm not a historian, I'm not a psychologist, but I am someone who is eager to incorporate into the various different disciplines. Um, so with regards to my typology, I could sit here for another hour and explain it, but just to say, I was really influenced by the work of Du Bois uh, at this point. So I've, there's lots of other people like Goffman with his stigma. Um, I looked into that as well. But uh, one thing that really appealed to me about Du Bois' two-ness of identity, if any of you are familiar with it, he talks about being both African and American. 
right, and how he, people negotiate. So some people might withdraw entirely, some people might assimilate in society, but the bulk of them, what do they do? So for me, that was really, really important, and it spoke to a lot of the themes that I have. Now, without coming across as really reductive, and, you know, the reason why it sounds like I've just swept over a lot is because there's so much ground to cover. So just bear with me when I s just jump from one discipline or one author or scholar to another. But for me, um, and many other scholars, you know, um, Hatem Bazian in the US um, and a couple of other scholars of anti-Semitism, oh, sorry, of Islamophobia have been looking into Du Bois and researching this. And Nasser Mir is another person who is very much interested in this. So um, at the time of my thesis, uh, the beginning stages actually, this is the sort of stuff that influenced me. So I wanted to look at how somebody can negotiate or balance being both Muslim and British and German and Jewish. So I came up with this, well, I didn't come up with it, it's just something that was uh, kind of inferred from my, from my research was a typology where people, you know, some people assimilate, immerse themselves. So in that sense, their identity tip, tips, in this, uh, tips in favor of becoming more like the sort of, eth sorry, the national identity, so uh, British or German kind of outweighs their Jewish, sorry, their Muslim or Jewishness respectively. Um, some people withdraw from wider society or isolate, and that would be considered more, um, you know, the opposite, where their Muslimness or Jewishness outweighs their Britishness or their Germanness. Now, who are those people in the middle, right? Who are those people? What do we call them? And I spoke to many people um, across Britain from my interviews when I, when I was discussing this with people who'd, um, about Islamophobia. And so many people came back saying, there is no difference between integration and assimilation. Stop using these policy buzzwords in front of us. W you know, what does it even mean? How are they distinct? And that's, my friends, is where <laughs> I decided that what is the term? Is there a term for people who negotiate or balance their identities? Now, we often read in multiculturalist studies about um, the state accommodating for individuals, right? Kind of trying to get them more involved and engaged in the steps that are taken um, to in encourage citizenship and to flourish and you know, for people to be themselves, right? So what I did um, was I tried because, you know, as much as we say that we can't categorize people, we shouldn't be doing it as researchers, you have to do it eventually in some way. So I just think all we're doing is just reframing uh, these categories as such. Um, so, you know, we can talk about that until the cows come home. But for sake of clarity, I decided to call these people accommodationists. So they accommodate, they negotiate. And most of them have tried in their own ways to balance, to find this sort of equilibrium of Germanness and Jewishness or Britishness and Muslimness. Um, and that was inferred, like I said, from much of the data that I'd collected, much of the sort of experiences that I had encountered, not just the Muslim case. For Obviously, for the historical case, it was through archival work. It was like, well, more memoirs and diaries that I'd read and excerpts from people's accounts. Um, so memoirs are really, really important. Um, just kind of people's reflections as an afterthought. I thought, you know, there's just so much detail there that um, is often missing from sort of media narratives, especially. So what was the aim? It was to find common points and differences in these lived experiences. Um, so, you know, there may be two distinct forms of hatred, but they're much in common in terms of how grievances are articulated and also how they shape the reactions and solutions to these problems of anti-Semitism and some phobia respectively. Um, I won't go into all the responses, but I think it's important just to get a gist of, you know, what am I talking about when I talk about um, responses of those who assimilate? So sometimes there were key figures that I looked at. Um, so the former foreign minister of Germany um, during that time was a man called Walter Rathnew, who was, um, I don't know if many of you are familiar, if, if I've got some historians in here, like they can, you can all call me out for, for being wrong, but um, he was uh, of Jewish heritage. He didn't consider himself Jewish, which was very interesting. He tried to dissociate himself as much as he could because for him, the Vaterland, so the fatherland was above all else, right? His allegiances, his loyalties, he was outspoken about that, that he had nothing else to do with his Jewishness. 
right? Um, and you know, he, he'd made that very clear. Similarly, one could say today, uh, well, not anymore, but and I know this has all been on record now, so I have to be very careful in the words that I use. But um, someone like Sajid Javed, right? He could be a figure who we could look at as a political figure who is of Muslim heritage, right? And he's gone on record to say things that, you know, some people within Muslim communities, majority, might, um, might disagree with. That's fine. He might not identify, I don't know um, on record if he, if he identifies as Muslim, but I feel that he has said in the past that he doesn't identify. But then again, this is, this is something that might change over time, which is something really crucial to remember that people's thoughts, beliefs, responses are fluid and they will change. We all change. I wore a hijab until the age of 19. Personal choice, right? This is the way things work. Identities are not fixed. Our responses are not fixed. And that's the beauty of researching all of this, right? And that's why individual accounts are so important. So um, that's kind of like the assimilationist sort of responses, right? These are just two figures, uh, but I think it's important to understand that each mode, so the three modes that I mentioned, have subcategories. So you could have expressions of assimilations that are political. Some might be social. Some might be just banal every day, right? Similarly, people who withdraw or isolate from society, um, Classic examples might be, you know, it, it, you know, it might just be somebody who is, we'd, we would question, is it self-isolation or is this actually a result of Islamophobia? Because sometimes when I spoke to people, some people didn't realize there was actually a term for this within the Muslim community. I went to pockets of the community that aren't often spoken to. So um, I was invited quite nicely to a gathering of elderly women um, in a very secluded part of Birmingham. Um, luckily, I'm half Punjabi, so I can kind of converse with them. So most, some of my interviews were, were conducted in that language. Um, and when I talked about you know, their experiences or interactions, I'd never, I never used the term Islamophobia or prejudice because it's leading. But I wanted to know how they felt engaging with society. Some of them, having spent several decades in this country, um, probably didn't have much interaction, not just not because they had felt hatred to us, I mean, it just never really happened, right? Um, for others, and this was quite interesting, I talked about the, they talked about experiences that people might have, but when kind of spoken to, they, they, they were like almost a denial of sorts, like their association with it was like, well, why would anyone do that? You know, because they had never really encountered something like this. That was very, very interesting. Um, obviously, some of them didn't feature in my, in my thesis for some reasons because I wanted to look at experiences, negative experiences. But it was important to notice. Um, similarly, what I, I thought was quite interesting was looking at the concept or the experiences of those from, um, in, in the Weimar times, Eastern Jews, so Ust students, the people who had come to West Germany, or sorry, the, the Germany as is, um, from the East, uh, who were probably a bit more, hate the term, but the lack of other terms, uh, what, what would be classified as ghettoized, you know, living in their own pockets or communities, and kind of seeing their experiences as well. Often some of them were a bit more practicing or a bit more overt in their expressions, much like the example I gave of those women in Birmingham. Um, so it was these sort of, sort of intricate, lived realities and how they negotiate then their identities as a result of this you know some of them might you know s fearing this uh, sort of islamophobia um some people i spoke to even said that i hate fear mongering and that's not what i'm tending to do but some people said you know because of the islamophobic attacks that they themselves or members of their close family had experienced they felt they wanted to protect their next generation and for their, from their point of view, they wanted to mo move to a nation state that was Islamic, right? Similarly, many people, um, so when it was, it was the Weimar, but then following that period, um, they made um, sort of, uh, uh, so they, they, they fled to Israel, right? It's that, I'm not saying that's the same at all, 
just to clarify, it's just looking at the, the sort of psychology behind why people would want to leave their homes. Obviously, um, I, you know, this was prior to the Holocaust, I should say. So um, it wasn't, you know, people need to get their history right as well, that it wasn't at the time where people were being put into mass concentration camps. But anyway, it's just, again, it's a sensitive topic, so we can't say, are you trying to say that this is the same thing is happening to Muslims? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that people have certain realities and certain experiences which might, for, for their own sake, they might want to leave a place that they've called home for three or four generations. Okay? Um, okay, so because I only have 10 minutes left and I wanted to say far more, I think it's important to look at those who accommodate. People who, you know, for instance, are involved in interfaith work, in, involved in community work. Um, but I found one thing that I found really, really important was even those people who accommodate, sometimes within their communities, um, it's not just about their own expression, but also they're also aware of the perceptions that people might have of them. So, for instance, um, when Islamophobic attacks, obviously the majority um, of victims happen to be women. Those who are overt in their expression of faith, those who wear hijab, are main targets of Islamophobic attacks. Um, so in times of you know um fear sometimes you know uh, you'd, you'd hear stories of mosques and imams saying you know it's okay you don't you know we're not saying that this the conversations around hijab let's just say um they um become a, bore, a bit more about you know personal choice and you know if, if you're fearing for your life then it's okay for you to so that's the narrative that you you can remove your hijab or you know that's the, these are the sort of conversations that are being had. Now, interestingly, I found that um, in the Weimar, we had sometimes in community centers or in, in synagogues, we had rabbis saying, don't draw unwarranted attention towards yourself so that people would then attack you. So it was the term was reshes, so basically kind of getting um, that sort of unwarranted attention from anti-Semites to then attack you, right? So it was kind of like even the narrative within the communities, those words that were said between one another, there's this kind of, you know, um, parallel that can be drawn in terms of how we speak to one another when we talk about protecting ourselves or preserving our identities and also our livelihoods. So, um, so yes, uh, these were the sort of uh, responses that people used to, to sort of uh, cope. Um, yeah, I could spend a whole other session talking about collective self-esteem. I will not get into that at all. Um, but what I want to do is kind of focus on uh, where we're headed, sort of reflections on... I wanted to talk about racialization as well because this was something that was a, sort of a fringe um, finding that needs more explanation that many scholars are not now interested in. Um, uh, and also the concept of, uh, you know, it, it, it brings into question the concepts of belonging, identity and um, solutions to hatred from these responses, especially accommodationist responses, those who balance and negotiate, talk about dialogue um, and re-education of society. So when, in order to understand prejudice, be it anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, hatred of any kind, we really need to reinterpret sort of an overhaul of our education system, right? So these are more policy driven findings, but um, what is it that's taught at schools? And you know, some of the researchers here today, we had a conversation earlier about you know, understanding prejudice or um, you know, hate, awareness of these things should be taught. You know, it, this, is, this is a normative judgment or a stance that, um, within schools, much like extremism, as much as I, you know, we were talking about how we, we try and avoid words or t key terms that might stir up hate, but um, much like extremism or, or of any kind should be, you know, ch children and, and, and um, young adults need that awareness. They also need to be aware of what hatred, prejudice, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia are in order for us to, to move and function as a society and to learn from history. Um, so, you know, if our aim is to foster a, a society that is cohesive and we believe in coexistence, it's only necessary for us 
to really engage with these, not just in a scholarly forum, but also in society, in um, the education system, in our local communities, to really, really assert you know, that we, we want things to change. Right? This can't continue happening. When we talk about never again or, or we're standing up to hate, what do we actually mean if we can't even have the terms of reference you know, in front of us or, or to you know, navigate or maneuver in these times, you know, so we, we need to um, be, you know, it's crucial that we're aware of this and reflect also on citizenship, um, British values, and not just that, but people's, you know, when we talk about collective understandings of our relationship with faith or uh, organized religion as well, I think these are so important um, to understand and get, kind of get a grasp of when it comes to tackling. Um, racial and religious hatreds. So these are the sort of things, you know, that stem from understanding lived realities and experiences. And I think that's really crucial. It's not just, you know, it's well and good just documenting how people feel or how people have experienced things. I'm not negating that. That's really important. But where do we move from there, right? What is the purpose of our academia if it's not um, about advocacy? I personally think. And that's something that I want to leave us on that, you know, we as academics have a duty or a function to better our societies. Well, that's my personal sort of opinion. Um, so yeah, I'd, I think I'm just going to end it at that, sped through it completely. Lots wasn't said, but um, hopefully publications might do that justice in the future. Thank you for listening.